Cafe. What have you got for us this week? We're gonna we're gonna wing it this week, but what have you got for us this week? Because I know stuff's going on that you you want to talk about. So right right now I'm actually dealing with a um, a client's not happy with his range on his EV. Um, basically the advertised range. I'm just gonna get into it. It's the advertised range. The the car's not meeting its advertised range. So now from a service side, I don't find anything wrong with anything, and I'm trying my best. I actually have the vehicle on loan this weekend, and I'm trying my best to adapt to the EV driving style to get this mileage out of it. And I guess my question is going to be, how do you guys navigate the sales side of a question on the service side? Interesting. Okay. I, I've dealt with this before. I've had to deal, not specifically with EV, but I've dealt with fuel efficiency, oil consumption. Um, I've dealt with shifting um, not not shifting in not what is expected on vehicles that have like two to 500 kilometers on them. So they're, they're not even through yeah. break-in period. I've dealt with all kinds of this. And I, I want to hear, cause Richard's worked on some pretty cool stuff. He's got his GTR license. Uh, Marshall's going to have a different set of set of things because I, I'm not entirely sure whether HD fleet mobile repair is going to have the same kind of fastidious customers like, like Steph and Richard yeah. and I are going to have. So, Marshall, I want to, I want to hear from you first. Have you had challenges like this, you know, where their where a brand new product goes out and the customer is not happy, it's not meeting expectations from a sales and service standpoint? How do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I I do run into it sometimes. So like, it's basically like a customer buys something with the expectation that it's going to meet some meet particular situation, like. Big trucks, um, mileage is big, right? Because um, a tenth of a mileage could be thousands of dollars over over a year, you know, thousands of dollars. So when a customer might buy a new truck and then and they might have 60000 on it, and then they call me and they say, hey, this truck is not getting the fuel economy that it was made out to have, you know, the advertised fuel economy. So typically, like for me, I would, you know, do some typical checks um, for fuel economy complaint and uh, collect as much data as possible. And then I would send that to uh, probably an OEM rep and um, uh, let them weigh in and um, see, I might even lean on them to see if they might help me with the customer. Like, hey, could you reach out to customer Mr. Steve, because, you know, he's under the impression that this at least explain to him or explain to me um, how he can get that kind of mileage that we've promised, you know, you know, uh, to our customers. And, you know, there's a lot of things that affect mileage besides just the truck itself. It could be what they're hauling or um, could be the um, uh, the elevations that they're higher hauling at uh, the weights that they're hauling at. So there's a lot of things that can affect it. But generally, I think I I will reach out to any and every um, uh, avenue that I have that I can uh, leverage uh, to try to help me with that customer. Because I might look at it and say, hey, there's nothing wrong with this thing. Like in Stefan's situation where he he's like, hey, this thing's doing what everything is supposed to do, but it's falling short 10 miles from where it's supposed to on uh, – other people that work with that one more often, or I might would uh, definitely reach out to my rep and say, hey, I got this customer. It's your job to help me with these scenarios. And I know I, I, I lean on my OEM reps a lot for diagnostics and uh, help with customers. You know, uh, that's what I typically do. Well, okay, Richard, you've probably had Similar concerns, especially at GTR level, when you get into the triple digit ticket, super special hypersports and stuff like that. Have you had that with GTRs or have you had that with like Nissan Sentras and, and Chevy Bolts? So, GTR, no. Um, most GTR customers are either there's, there's two sides of the spectrum with GTR customers. They're either the ones that do all the maintenance because there's a ton of required maintenance on them. Uh, like after your first 
what was it? If you purchased a brand new GTR, you have to change out the complete driveline fluid after, I think it's after the first like 17 or 1800 kilometers that the vehicle has on. That includes like transmission drain and fill, differential drain and fill, uh, and uh, engine as well. Like all the fluids get drained out of the vehicle and then they all get replaced and reset. Um, so you have two camps for that, right? You have the camp that will do all the maintenance. They'll put the recommended like OEM tires on there, which I think are Michelin Pro Pilots at the time. They'll pay for road force balance. They'll, they'll do everything. And then you have the wicked opposite of the spec end of the spectrum. And there's no middle ground I've found with the few GTR owners that I've uh, dealt with. They're either like crazy cheap and buy like the cheapest tires. They don't want them road force. They just want to mount and balance. They don't want to do any maintenance other than an oil change. Um, so yeah, that that's all I've dealt with on the GTR side is the two the two polar opposites: customers who maintain them and customers who buy them and then can't afford to maintain them. Now, we work in a Nissan. Um, we never got. I had my qualification for the uh, what's there for the Leaf, but we Nissan dicked around. They were switching from the Leaf to the area at the time and the shop that I was at, we got caught in the middle. We could have gotten certification for LEAF, but because Nissan pushed the area, we lost certification for EVs because our hoists were built to the specs that Nissan wanted them to, and then Nissan came out with revised specifications and none of our hoists qualified, and they were all in-grounds. So we lost certs there, but I did deal with quite a few off-warranty LEAFs, um, tons of battery issues because they don't have cooling. And the leaf is, you only get, I think you're, you get like, you get less than on a good day, you get less just under around 200 kilometers for a full charge. Now at GM with the bolt and the huge battery recalls that we've had with the, the bolt, um, all the bolts for the longest time could only charge up to 80%. And now we've gone through the revisions now, and now customers will be able to charge it to what they think is a hundred percent, but is actually only uh, GM has a buffer on the customer facing side. We can, as technicians, we can plug in and see the actual charge of the vehicle, but that what we see for the charge is always 10% less listed for the customer, right? So when we see 0%, it's 0%, that battery's dead. That means, but when a customer sees like one, 2%, there's still 12 to 11% left in that battery pack. That's the buffer. Now customers, yeah, customer, we have several customers who complain about they're not getting the range that they're supposed to be getting. Um, you know, they're, you know, I have one customer who drives like a normal, drives EV like an, in normal two pedal mode and another customer who drives it in one pedal mode. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with those different modes. Um, Marshall, are you familiar with them? One pedal versus two pedal? One pedal is like driving a forklift. As soon as you take your foot off, it goes into automatic regen, applies the brake lights, and it will actually stop the car. Two pedals, your normal gas and brake mode. So they both complain about range, and then I have to talk to them. I'm like, well, how, how are you driving it? How are you charging it? You know, are you charging it to 100%? You know, what kind of charger do you have at home? It's, you know, EV range comes down all down to... Um, there's so many factors, right? Do you turn your AC on? Do you turn your defrost on? Do you use your power windows? They, the, it's a big learning curve for customers to go from an ICE unit to an EV because everything you do inside that vehicle draws from the battery. Not from the 12 volt battery, it draws from the main battery. And the main battery is even used to charge the 12 volt battery as well. So that's just, it's really just a learning experience on that end. And then when it comes to customers complaining about fuel mileage, um, obviously from the GM world, fuel mileage is, is one argument to one side of it. Um, you know, it comes down to diagnostics then, you know, do you have a leaking injector? Is, you know, is the map reading properly? So a lot of it comes down to, um, is there anything actually wrong with the vehicle to find out? And then maybe it's just a learning, like it's just a teaching experience to the customer at that point. Like, you know, how are you driving your vehicle? Like EVs is a big thing, but the range, the range thing is becoming more and more prevalent. And there is, I'll have to look at it. 
because there's a lawsuit right now against Tesla for falsified EV ranges. Customers are not getting what their EV ranges are. Um, there's always been, I can't remember what the last major lawsuit that settled was. I think it was against, for some reason, Toyota and the Prius pops to my mind. And there was a massive lawsuit that landed where a huge amount of the customer base was paid back because the mileage, the EPA mileage ratings were not correct with real world, right? And that all boils down. There's a whole, you, we can go off on a tangent on that with diesel gate and everything like that. But a lot of the times it just comes down to, this is a teachability moment where we can teach the customers, you know, how their product is gonna perform. And um, the other big thing is, especially with the EVs, like you hear it all the time because Alberta is a big oil and gas province and we're all like, yeah, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't burn gas, you know, we don't want to see it on the roads and stuff like that. Like EVs have their place. They have their 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 niche market for sure. Um, me personally, I'd rather deal with an EV owner than a hybrid owner. Those are totally different people in their own respects for most high, like most hybrid owners. Um, but everybody here in Alberta is like, oh, the cold, you know, minus 45, you can't drive your your vehicle and my, if yes the range is reduced but you can still drive it what is actually killing batteries is heat management heat will kill a battery pack faster than freezing it will and that's the nissan leaf is the easiest argument there the first generation of the leaf down in arizona nevada like all those warm desert states that had a large influx of leafs you saw up to like a third of battery degradation within the first three years because they didn't have cooling so there's lots of tidbits in there so you marshall talking about you know in in truck you know give an example for stefan what they're hauling how they're hauling where they're hauling you know all of that stuff can affect range and i think richard summarized it best stefan is teaching your customers i think that's the Marshall's thought process, make sure you gather as much data as you possibly can from your DSM or whatever the nomenclature is for the, the person that your service manager reports to at a corporate level, not your group or, or whatever, but the brand, you know, acquiring information from them if you can get access to them, getting access to any literature that you can you know, put together as, as kind of like a portfolio because it's not gonna be, if you've experienced it once, you're gonna experience it way more than once. So gathering a portfolio of both generalized documentation for the, the concern that you're having, as well as the specific knowledge that you can bring to the table, stuff that you, and this is where we're talking about RO writing, right? A little bit about RO writing, having more detail, very specific detail to both what the car is doing actively and what the specs uh, of specific things are that affect. So you're talking about EV range, okay? And and I've never done any EV range stuff like like you and Richard have, but I've done lots of fuel economy and, and oil consumption stuff over the years. More data is better. More detail is better. There is very little time where that is ever going to bite you in the ass. Very, 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 very little. The only time that's ever gonna bite you in the ass is if it's communicated in a way that it looks like it's gospel. Like this is the range in which we are expecting to get in this climate, in this area, based on the severe operating conditions with which we expect you to be driving. We don't expect you to see, you know, for example, spitballing a number. If the range is supposed to be 400 kilometers, the range is not 400 kilometers. The range is never gonna be 400 kilometers. The range is gonna be somewhere between probably 250 kilometers and 500 kilometers based on altitude, air temperatures, humidity, drive style, altitude, like all of those factors go into how something can change its fuel economy or range. And how you communicate that is as important as what you communicate. So having the data, making sure you have detailed and it's communicated well, and more importantly, it's communicated well to the customer. Like I don't know, you, you don't have to say whether you do or you don't, but this is where having a, a well-educated foreman capable of communicating to customers is vital because your service advisors 
don't have the time to be talking to customers in this kind of detail in this kind of problem. Service managers should only be involved if there is a need to usurp any crisis uh, of, of conversation with the customer. Otherwise, a shop foreman is perfect for this circumstance. Someone who's capable and understanding of, of product, understanding of what testing is done or was done or should be done, what those things are represented of. Example for my own self, back in the day, and I love using the phrase back in the day, but back in the day, oil consumption was a concern on, on caravans that they were going through way too much oil between between intervals. So the easiest, you know, idea was you get the customer to come into the service drive because I was capable as a technician now in the service drive, check the oil level, let the car come in, let the car sit for a specified amount of time that the DSM had said, okay, if they've come off, you're doing oil consumption test, the first thing you do is the car has to sit for 10 minutes before you do anything. Okay, come in. You do your meet and greet, you do your walk around, you get the, the, the work order set up, get them to sign off on what we're, we're starting to do. You let it sit and you, you know you converse with you, have a, a genuine conversation with the customer. You try to acquire as much detail about the circumstances with which they drive, when they drive, how they drive, where they drive, what they do, do they tow, do they not tow, do they take kids to soccer, da 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 da, da. I Provide as much detail as you possibly can in that work order as possible. Let it sit for 10 minutes, do a oil level check, Okay, is it down any? Yes, it's down a little bit. Okay, so it's possible. You fill it up, write the line. Let it sit, make sure that line stays stays true. Show the customer what the line is like. Let them go on their merry way and say, come back in a thousand kilometers. Come back in a thousand kilometers. They do exactly the same, meet, greet, walk around, da 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 dance, dance on your toes and, and so on and so forth with the customer. Check the oil level. Is it down any? Yes, it's down some. Okay. Fill up oil in a measured jug, specifically measured jug. And if you don't know how to properly measure, this is a, this is a thing that I had to teach apprentices uh, in every place that I ever worked. You have to look at your meniscus, okay? Oil does not sit in a container flat across the top. It, everything will have a touch of a meniscus and you have to measure to the right amount. When you pour it in and you're pouring a little bit of time until it gets to the level line again, Check your meniscus level, not where edge it touches on the edge necessarily, but your meniscus level. And then you write it down. And at that point where you've done it, you have to do it twice. Do it in two successions to get a decent averaged number. And this is what our DSM back at the time had asked for. Two of those. And you take the average of two. And you take the number of milliliters that you used over the number of kilometers that they drove. And you give them a number. And it's supposed to fall within a certain range. Not an, an amount, it, it, like it can't, you know, one liter per hundred kilometers or whatever the case would be. I can't remember what the spec is off the top of my head right now. I think it's a, a liter per hundred kilometers, which was a bit asinine, but um, a liter per hundred That's kilometers. That's a lot. It's a, it was a lot. If I recall, it was just shy of using, I think Chrysler's spec back in the time, and don't quote me, but I think Chrysler's spec at the time was like 0. 0.9 liters per hundred, per thousand kilometers. It was like there would be a half a liter of oil left at between intervals. I think that was a spec back then. So there were some that were using that kind of oil and we did end up doing some repairs on some caravans, but it was a lot less than those who complained about it. But until you do your due diligence, you have a proper communication with the customer, both as a foreman, as a service advisor, as a service leader, do your due diligence, get your data from your DSM, get your data from your brand training, get your data from, from your testing, do real world testing and real world numbers um, and make sure you communicate with your customer all the way through. Talk about, you know, Richard said, educate your customer. Marshall said, get all the data you possibly can. Until you do all of those, you can't do your due diligence properly for that customer. So if anybody out there listening has any input for Stefan, by all means, you know, send us a message on LinkedIn, send us a message on YouTube or, or, fate or, yeah. or Spotify, let us know any little tidbits you can add. One uh, one thing I want to add is, um, especially for Stefan, I don't know how your store is set up, but this is a good uh, a good opportunity for you as well to build some good wicked rapport with your sales team, to pull them aside and to teach them because we all know half like sales gets a brochure, they have a whack ton of information that they have to convey, and half the like 
even with like, even with these podcasts, right? Customers only have a, a certain amount of attention span. And that's why some places have like a second delivery, right? Where they'll do the initial vehicle delivery. They walk them through your basic controls. This is how your mirrors adjust, your seats adjust, set your radio, you know, turn your headlights off and on. Have a great day. Here you go, customer. Enjoy your vehicle. And then they come back in like a week and then they go through the custom, all the questions that the customer has. But this is a perfect opportunity for you to build a wicked rapport with, with either your entire sales team, your sales managers, and, and get them on board with, you know, informing the customer, especially because, like I said, EVs and high, like EV and hybrid customers, they're, they're pretty similar in that basis is that they're buying a vehicle not because they're going to not like with hybrid owners, not because they're not going to have to get so much gas, but they're more concerned about their, their consumption and their range than they are about how much they're going to spend on fuel. Right. So um, hybrid owners are, are, are pretty like hybrid owners are pretty particular about that EV owners. Um, that's a whole different ball game. Right. But this, like I said, this gives you a perfect opportunity to start building that rapport with, with your sales team. If, if, and, and strengthen that bond so they know that they can come to you and ask you questions because my sales team right now will bring customers back to me and they'll ask, they'll be like, here's the shop foreman, ask whatever you want because I can't answer all those, they've been straightforward. I can't answer all those technical questions that you want to know. Here's the guy you want to ask. So awesome. That's, that's a great that's lead. My, that's a great lead. Yeah. We're, 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 yeah, we're going to add about that here in a minute. And I was going to add to like, um, you mentioned about the details. So like uh, one thing that I uh, am pretty hardcore about is that we are the last line of defense between our customers and their warranties. So the more detailed I am with uh, a vehicle that's in warranty with my diagnostics, anything I notice visually or during testing, whether it's affecting it right now or not, um, it's all saved. My notes cannot be altered once I input them. They're in there forever. And so um, it's important too going forward for that customer's warranty um, while it's still in warranty is that, you know, if there's beginning to be a problem, uh, I can have it notated in my notes. Like, hey, this customer came in and they're having uh, fuel economy issues or they're complaining about fuel economy issues. I noted this and this, but I haven't found anything else. They leave, they got to handle what they've got to handle. They might come back three, four months later. They're saying, hey, um, I've done everything you said. I noted all these things, especially with like an oil uh, usage complaint. You know, I've run into that tons in diesel and I give them a sheet to fill out every time they add oil. Uh, they've got to fill the sheet out and it's got, so I can track the oil usage for the mileage. So they'll bring it back and all of those things are important for the warranty going forward so that I can help them get the most out of the warranty that they purchased with their vehicle. And, and like I said, I feel like we are the last line of defense between them. It, it's a stroke of a pen for me to decline a warranty. It's literally, if I say this, they don't get warranty the rest of the time they have the vehicle, or if I put this, they've continued with their warranty, or this is going to be a warrant over repair. It's all on how I see it and how I look at it. And I feel like, uh, people buy stuff from our OEMs, your guys' OEMs, because they believe in the product, you know? So I feel like it's we're, we're real important when it comes to that. Agreed. Agreed. Awesome question, Stefan. We, we, we kind of went around. I'm not entirely sure whether we totally answered your question, to be completely frank, but I think we did. And in a roundabout way, we cover a whole lot of bits in there. So that's awesome. Again, folks, anybody listening, if you have any comments, let, let us know.